There's a there's a, kind of like a Limburger cheese note as well, like something really like meaty and umami. And with that, welcome to the tasting notes. What's going on, everybody? I am Chip Walton. Welcome to Chop and Brew. Ding! Cheers. Uh, a rather unexpectedly smoky episode of Chop and Brew, by the way. Fans and followers have asked for more grain to glass brew day episodes, and I am happy to announce there are a line of them coming up, starting with this fun one right here. In this video, I brew a quick turn version of Old Toberfest Smoked Rye Lager from Michael Dawson's Mashmaker Homebrew Recipe Book. And I learned the hard yet surprisingly delicious way just how much impact a second generation yeast pitch can have on the flavor of a new beer. Spoiler alert, it's a lot. We'll get to all that just ahead. The brew day breakdown, some smoked yeast shenanigans, and Old Toberfest garage tasting notes with the one and only Michael Dawson. Before we roll out the barrels, Chop and Brew is brought to you. Hey, there's a squirrel coming into my garage. Don't do it. There's a cat that sometimes comes in here. There's a squirrel about to bum rush my garage. Before we roll out the barrels, we gotta mention the Chop and Brew is brought to you with support from Imperial Yeast, changing the game with their new Imperialis Hybrid Yeast series. The first release from that series, Capri, born and raised for your citrus forward hoppy ales. More info at imperialyeast.com. And of course, the Patreon party people. Join them in keeping the show on and popping like an airlock at patreon.com slash chop and brew. So, Old Toberfest, what is that? Well, first off, you can find the full recipe from Mashmaker in the video description below and read Dawson's classically poetic explanation for brewing such a unique beer. But the bottom line, Old Toberfest is a Marzen-ish German land beer brewed with a hefty dose of malted rye and just a kiss of smoke by way of beechwood smoked Weiermann Rauch malt. When brewed by the book, Dawson says to expect a complex, bready, earthy, slightly spicy flavor with a hint of woodsy warmth. Remember, words like a kiss and just a hint for later on. I brewed this beer in late summer, early fall 2021 in a mad rush to get something on tap for Oktoberfest season. That means I wanted a beer that would turn fast, so I went to a yeast that I knew could do that, Bootleg Biology's Regal Lager Blend, a blend of German lager yeast and Oslo Kvaik. Just a couple of months prior, I brewed a super smoke bomb of a red ale with this blend and it fermented out in about three days. I let it condition for a week or so before taking it to Wisconsin and serving it to my good friends at Shore Lunch with Nate P. That's a YouTube channel that you should definitely check out. Like seriously, pause this chop and brew video, open a new tab, Go subscribe to Shore Lunch with Nate P and watch a bunch of those episodes, including the one I'll link below where I present the beer to the guys. That first beer, which I called Shore Lunch Campfire Smoked Red Ale, was brewed with a large percentage of Shore Doll style Alderwood smoked dried malt from Sugar Creek Malting in Indiana. And to say it provided a huge punch of smoke to the beer would actually be quite an understatement. It was over the top smoky awesomeness if that's your thing. So on top of the quick timeline performance I knew I could expect from this yeast, I kind of thought that yeast slurry might provide a low-key smoky layer to the second beer and that pretty much sets the scene for the brew day. Three gallons at about 161. We lost like two degrees. Since we've got some rye going on, we're going to start with some rice hulls and we're mashing in. Ooh. 
you really can seriously smell that smoked malt right out of the gate in the Munich. Very bready, very smoky. Nice. So that brought the volume up to maybe three and a half. So three gallons of water, seven-ish if I remember correctly, pounds of malt. Nice, 152. It's probably a little warmer. There's pockets of hotter, but 152. While I got it, I'm going to call it that. Cover it up. Boom. All right, 10 minutes of mash out are complete. Going to do a little recirc action here and see if we can't get us a nice clean wort going. You all grain brewers know what's up. We're recirculating to try to get the, uh, the grist mash bed to kind of set. So that once we start running off the liquid, it doesn't really channel and it doesn't carry any chunky grains with it. Hmm, it's getting clear though already, which is nice to see. Look at that lovely, lovely wort. Mm, that is a fall time color if I ever seen one. That's going to be wonderful for drinking next to the bonfire with some leaves falling all around. I think we're about there. This one has hardly any little bits of malt. The last one didn't have much either. And for the runoff, my co-worker Dan at Northern Brewer St. Paul suggested I get some of this 3 8 tubing and a turnkey clamp because the heat from the ball valve, heat from the mash transferring to the ball valve would definitely make this tubing probably slip off. So I'm gonna connect it on that end to the ball valve. On this end, the tube's gonna go into the kettle. I'm gonna give it a clamp so that we make sure we don't accidentally pop this tube out and start collecting work <laughs> on the floor of my garage, which is definitely not where we want it. Open the valve slowly. Ooh, that is hot. That ain't no joke. You can see the work's coming through. I'm gonna slow it down for a little bit at first. And you can see we got work running through. Woo -woo! Most excellent. So that is my new setup. I love it. I mean, a lot of people would argue that if you're going to brew three gallons, why not brew five or ten? I honestly don't need that much beer. Um, this really does cut down on some time because uh, it doesn't take as long to do any of the heating of smaller uh, amounts of water. And I just I want to be brewing more frequently and having more fun with it here. I'm in the garage, obviously, but this outfit was actually built for winter brewing that's about to come up inside. After running off into the kettle, just by eyeballing it, I only have about three gallons maybe at the most of uh, wort, and that's what I want to end up with. And it's about 1040, which should be my pre-boil, even if it was at more at four. So that's a little confusing, but I heated one last gallon to about 180. I'm gonna pour it in and do a second rinse, a second bat sparge, and see if I can't get the volume up on the kettle more than anything. And then if I need to figure out gravity, you know, if we need to add something, extract, sugar, hopefully we won't have to do that. Hopefully just by boiling we'll get it higher. Second sparge is done. I did uh, a second recirculation, second sparge. And now I've kind of overshot a little bit. Um, I know from, from brewing with this, that's about four, maybe even a little four plus underneath those two rivets all right here we are we're nearing a boil i actually ran out of propane while trying to come up to a boil so that put a, deli a little delay in the day and then because it's so close to the top of this kettle i wanted to just kind of for uh first wort hop this wort instead of dropping them in at boil um because that just kind of eases it into all those oils and nucleation so I, I feel like there's a, a less chance of a boil over with first wort hops. I could totally just be making that up. I did just take a gravity reading. It is 10 bricks. So I must have gotten a little diluted patch the last time I did a reading. So I'm feeling pretty good about this. Uh, we're looking for a starting gravity actually of about 10.51 to 10.53. So I think we're going to get there without any DME or sugar. Something else I recently learned from a couple of co-workers at Northern Brewer is you can actually use Firm Cap S before a boil. 
I thought it was only for fermentation and, and keeping down um, blow off and croissant. But apparently you can put it in to a almost boiling wort to also help minimize the chance of a boil over. We have reached a boil without major incident. Very nice. That firm cap house really seems to, to do the thing. We're treating our first word hops like our 60 minute. Ooh, look at that glint off the spoon. Yeah, that works better than a phone flashlight right there. That's cool. Ooh, y'all just caught a moment. Y'all caught me having a cinematic moment. Um, but yeah, as you can see, we're boiling. Well, we're going to do this for 60 minutes and kill it. Chill it. Thought I'd grab one more shot now that I got the garage door fully open just so you can appreciate my boil. My boiling old Toberfest. Hope you're enjoying the brew day episode so far. Before we take you down into the basement to pitch yeast, which is really the bigger part of the story, I think. I wanted to let you know that old Toberfest was actually the second beer I brewed in my then new mini masher. I call it mini the masher. This is a five gallon igloo cooler outfitted with a bazooka tube screen on the inside, a ball valve. Uh, I made this in hope of having kind of like something easy to do small, uh, small batch brewing in the garage or more importantly, a more, uh, a less space consuming brew day for all grain indoors. Since then I've actually one up this and I inherited a three gallon which is going to be my jam this winter for my co-worker Brad Siegel at uh, Northern Brewer. It used to apparently be like a partial mash mash ton I guess which is kind of a cool thing that they used to do at Midwest. So anyway the reason I tell you all that is the first beer I brewed in this was also from Mash Maker. It's a, a Weizen beer or a Fest beer um, and I didn't shoot any video that day because I actually wanted to concentrate on brewing. But I wanted to let you know that when Dawson came over to shoot the tasting notes for Oktoberfest that you're going to see very shortly, uh, we also poured up some of that Fest beer. So I will link a bonus video tasting notes with good old Michael Dawson on his Mutne Fizen Fest beer from Mashmaker as well. All right. Let's get into the basement and show you the yeast part of this episode. We skipped a few steps because uh, I had a lot going on in the garage, but now I've got it cooled to about 71. The Regal Lager strain, which is German lager yeast mixed with Oslo Kvike, which is known for doing lager-ish ferment, says it can ferment from 50 to 95, higher end creates sulfur. Uh, I thought about trying to get this down to like into the 50s, in the fridge maybe overnight um, but since this yeast right here from the smoked red ale i did this summer is already kind of gone through a batch of beer i'm gonna just think it's pretty good to go ready to go i'm gonna get this to 70 maybe upper 60s i'm gonna pitch some of this yeast which you'll see the weird new thing i've never done before in a second and then I might even put it on the front porch overnight. Our front porch has been getting in the mid 50s. Um, but I don't really think there's a reason to have to do that other than the fact that this is a split lager strain slash Kvike. So I think they're suggesting you start really low so that German lager kicks in and then the Oslo Kvike takes over once it ramps up. But we're almost into the 60s. What we have in this flask is the slurry from my smoked red ale, my campfire smoked red ale that we did for the shore lunch with Nate P collaboration. This was probably my favorite beer I did this summer. So what I'm gonna do, and I've never done anything like this before, I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna decant some of it into this cup and drink it because I missed this beer and it's been gone for a long time. Granted, it's very flat now. And then I'm gonna put some of the slurry into this jar with some beer to top it off because I've been informed that the best way to keep yeast that you've washed is actually in fermented beer. So that could even be like Bud Miller Coors. It could be, in this case, the beer it actually came from. 
but a fully attenuated beer versus water because water will actually make that yeast do different things and maybe you almost start kind of making new reactions or getting activity whereas a done beer that this yeast can find nothing else to do in will keep it more dormant chips tips i learned that from a white labs webinar holla so what i'm gonna do is i'm going to man y'all if i mess this up it's because it's because i'm trying to videotape it at the same time i'm gonna decant uh, a good bit of it in here oh my gosh i can immediately smell it it smells just like the joyful brew that i had this summer so hopefully that's good but i need to decant more of this before oh r.i.p so that's going down the drain so this is the yeast cake i'm left with i mean it's a lot of yeast 800 milliliters of yeast so i'm gonna give it a really good swirl the idea here is i want to save i should have said this off the off the get I'm trying to save some of this because this is a lot more yeast than I need for three gallons and I want to save some for future beers because it works so well but man you can smell it is smoky so it makes sense to like pick some of this into a smoky beer so here I go I'm gonna put some and this will be yeast that we're saving I'm gonna try to get it very close to the top and then the rest of this which is probably even more than I need I'm going to put into our three gallons of beer that is way more than I need I can tell we got some smoked yeast for preservation we got some smoked yeast to put into our old Toberfest smoked rye lager and I got me a little something something for the effort so yeah that's my super professional looking rig I have poured some fairly clear wort. I did get a little hot pickup or protein pickup at the end, but for the most part, it was pretty clear. I went ahead and stopped at two and a half gallons so that I could leave some of that funk behind. And honestly, this thing is going to be like such a rager. <laughs> I'm not going to pour all this in, but I definitely think this is going to be a big fermenter. So I'm just going to get... Turns out, if you just give it some aggressive jackhammering, it actually gets in there. So I didn't have to go like sanitize the end of a wooden spoon or something nutso for the heck of it. Now that I figured that out, I'm gonna put a little more. We're gonna see what happens. What? 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 So it's 71 now. My plan is to put it on our back porch, which is getting in the low, low to mid 50s overnight, uh, just to kind of temper it a little bit and then let it just do what it wants to do. But look at them big old chunks. Chunks! Who knows? If this doesn't turn out, this is going to be a bummer because this was a good brew day. It's the next morning after pitching. I moved it to our front porch, uh, which looks like it got about 58 overnight. I put it in this tub on the off chance that it just like blew up and over. I didn't want it to do that on the carpet or the hardwood floor inside. And it is bubbling. Obviously the lager yeast is appreciating the temperature. The Kvike is doing its thing and fermenting literally hours after being pitched. The nice brown, creamy Kruisen. Got a lot of yeast doing its thing. Look at that. Bam. We are looking at some very happy and active yeast. So my plan is to just let this kind of free rise throughout the day as the porch warms up if it gets too warm i might take it inside keep it in the upper 60s lower 70s because i think it's supposed to get about upper 70s out here today but this beer is off to the races
All right, this is the second morning, so less than 36 hours probably after pitching. I had to move the beer to the table because Jonas was messing around with it too much. Jonas, uh, say hey to everybody. Uh-oh. Uh, uh. Uh Hi. Can you wave? Hey, everybody. So the beer, as you can see, the airlock is completely done. We got it wrapped in a dog blanket because I'm classy like that. There's still a little croissant kind of on top. If I move it, it'll probably start to break up. But it seems to be pretty much done fermenting. Obviously, I'm not going to like keg it today, let it sit. But once again, another Kvike, or in this case, Kvike blend, Kvike combo ferments in about less than 36 hours. Um, you could argue, some would argue that's too fast, but I think the science is still out. If that's true, either way, we're going to have an old Toberfest and a Fest beer from a couple of days earlier. Both done, fermenting, let them condition for a couple of days, maybe cold crash them, get them into kegs, carbonate for October. What do you think? Yeah, hi. What do you think about Oktoberfest? It's your birth month. You just barely squeaked it in there, Halloween baby. There's a... There's a, kind of like a Limburger cheese note as well. Like something really like meaty and umami. And with that, welcome to the tasting notes. Michael Dawson, creator of the Old Toberfest Smoked Rye Lager, is in the house. It's a good garage, technically, but thanks for having me. In the garage. Uh, so you've seen it brewed. You've seen the very interesting, unique, and wacky yeast pitch. Um, I don't think we really checked in on the video after that, so it fermented, clearly. Uh, it kept about 64. It turned out beautiful. Like, the color is beautiful. It's this bronze, deep bronze copper that you would expect a Martzen kind of style beer to be but we're learning a hard lesson the enjoyable way i guess is if you pitch a yeast cake from a extremely smoky beer without really cleaning it up much it's going to commandeer it's going to hijack the next beer i would say this beer does not taste like <laughs> much like even because i've had like some oktoberfest like roush toberfest or mm -hmm. you know great twist on marts and beers that have like smoke and this is not it this is is over the top as the smoked red from which the yeast cake came from was. Would you agree? Yeah. <laughs> I think if you really like Rauch beers, you would you would dig this. Yeah. It is smoke front to back. And that in the original recipe is just kind of like a low to low medium flavor note. Mm -hmm. And this is, it's all about the smoke. And a very different smoke too, mm -hmm. right? Because like... 10 ounces of beech wood is what should be like coming through in the original recipe. And this is that 10 ounces of beech wood plus this shockingly uh, large impact of alderwood smoked malt, which just is way more unique and intense. Or at least the way that Sugar Creek does it too, that Soinhus method, which is just like, I mean, the smoke is just so much more embedded in every kernel of that grain. And your repitch was a pretty large percentage of the batch too, right? True. As much liquid as was probably in it, you know, it's probably a, a sampler glass worth of that beer still got involved and blended hey, Charlie. into what should have just been a, a, a nice old Toberfest. So I don't think you could replicate this if you wanted to, but if you wanted to offset some of the smoke, you know, a little more caramel malt, maybe mash a little higher, but this is a Frankenstein of a whole different... Thing. I would smash it. Beer though. good. <laughs> Beer good. Smoke good. Just not what we thought it would be. I'm trying to think if there's anything else to really say. Like, the process was fun. It was the second time using my mini masher. The first time using it on video uh, went smooth. Went well. It was really fun to be brewing from the book once again, scaling it down and trying to use the mini mash to be kind of like this new three gallon system. So I ain't hating it. Most people 
think it's a little too over the top. But it's the, over the top, but I like rout beer, and mm -hmm. I, yeah, I can hang. You can hang? I can hang. Okay. Just like these Adirondack chairs that we're going to show you how to build right after these messages. Right, Charlie? So Mashmaker, Michael Dawson, it's available in E format. You're welcome. I helped make that happen. <laughs> we'll put the link below. Uh, say someone brews the old Toberfest and doesn't throw the frankenstein -y dregs of a smoked beer. Uh, any tips? Any expectations? It's going to be a very nice but slightly twisted version of an Oktoberfest. It's going to be a little smoky. It's going to have some some kind of nice grassy, minty, phenolic notes from the rye. You will enjoy it. Chop for chop. Brew for brew. <laughs> smoke for smoke. Yeah. Over smoke. Smoke it up. Don't we don't smoke rock beer in Muskogee. <laughs> we don't take Trips on LSD. Although for a smoky throwback style land beer uh, of an Oktoberfest, I can't actually really believe or doubt that this weird version isn't too far removed from maybe what might have happened when these were brewed. You know, rustic, smoky, picking up some of those like minerally, almost kind of briny notes, but still smooth and clean for the most part. Maybe. I would suggest hitting this with a little bit of oak, a little bit of just like regular wood, or maybe even like a spirit filled wood, I think would be kind of nice and play with that smoke, almost kind of seem like it's doing a, a whiskey scotch type of thing in the final beer. So check out the recipe, brew it up real quick. Uh, Oktoberfest is pretty much behind us at this point, but I think this would be a great fall time beer throughout November, December, even into the holidays. But definitely put this one on your calendar for next year, spring or summer. Ferment it with the traditional lager style or do it like I do it all the time, procrastinating and throw some kvike at it <laughs> and push it into like clean lager-esque territory with the kvike. So all the recipes in the video description, the Michael Dawson bonus fest beer tasting will be in the video description. Uh, just check out the video description. Who knows what else I'll think of in editing to drop in there. Uh, and as always, man, chop for chop, brew for brew, more brew day episodes coming up. It's been kind of like a funny year of sitting on footage that's now ready to get rolled out. So happy October, happy end of October, happy fall. Let's get into the holidays safe and sound.